guys, it's Dr. Greer. Dr. Gals will be hopping on in a minute. We're doing another episode of Carpools and Cannulas and talking about more breast stuff today. So once she hops on, we'll get going. I hope you guys are having a delightful evening on this fine, cold, snowy Monday. All right, there's Dr. Gals. You guys can leave questions in the comments as we go, or if you have ideas hey. for other topics. Cold, hey, huh? I'm good. How are you? How are you? I'm good. It's really cold, and we got like three inches of snow oh, wow. yesterday. So. We um, it's cold here, but like, you know, mm -hmm. like busy. <laughs> sorry, mm -hmm. but we think it's cold. As soon as the it's, sun comes down. Okay, because yes. you pay more to live there. People are smuggling eggs across the border. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah. Yeah. For real? They're dumb. I, feel, I didn't know they're like, expensive it's here, but thing. maybe I'll yeah, just get I know. some chicken. Eggs are so expensive, and so it's become this thing. And then I'm like, do people really eat that many eggs? Or not? It's sort of like toilet paper hoarding at this point. I don't know. Yeah, I mean. I think at my hungriest, I ate a dozen, a dozen in eggs. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I've been doing intermittent fasting, and I hadn't eaten for like eighteen hours, and I made like six, and I ate them, and I was still hungry. Oh, okay. Like twelve yeah. hard-boiled eggs would be awful. Is it? I, I don't know. I there's this recipe for hard-boiled egg pudding, which <laughs> sounds gross, but it's amazing, and it uses allulose sweetener um coconut milk and cocoa powder and cinnamon and you blend it like in a vitamix and then you have to let it sit overnight and the egg smell totally goes away it's amazing it's like chocolate mm -hmm. mousse you could definitely okay. it doesn't all right i'll take your word on it <laughs> they're on that yeah i mean i think people under eat eggs when they're like i eat eggs for breakfast yeah. and i'm still hungry and i'm like yeah but you have like great you gotta have like six Hi, Amanda, you're watching tonight. You were on last time, weren't you? Didn't you watch last time we did a Carpools and Candles too? I feel like you were on here. So yeah, well, thanks, thanks for everybody. watching again. So we're gonna bust some boobs. Boob yes. Was that the? Yes, because we love, I mean, we both love breast surgery and there's like a lot of just weird things. You know what else, what other myths we should talk about too, although it's not breast surgery related. Oh yeah. Pumping and dumping and it when is, you actually relevant, need to. I think. There's my other Amanda. Hi, no, you're the, on last the time too. are watching. <laughs> right. Well, I know we're in good company. Cool. All right. Let's see. What's your what question do you get the most that drives you nuts? It's pretty this? common. Or not well, drives I you nuts, one but today like, that comes up, yeah. and it's like my implants have been in for a while. They don't bother me. I'm happy with them. What do I need to do? Um, nothing. Right. Yeah. Nothing. Nothing. As long as they're intact, if they're silicone. If they're saline, it's not a big deal. If they rupture, but right. if they're silicone, they do need to be. So, intact. yeah. So, people get worked up about the 10-year mark, but it's um, mm -hmm. when two of the major companies' warranty expire. Um, however, so if you have an implant pro but just for an implant problem, like capsular contracture, they now will warranty them for rupture for the lifetime of the implant, if I'm not mistaken, for all of them. I have not yeah, checked I feel like recently, I but I remember you telling recently. me this. So, but for rupture, you definitely want to remove it. Saline rupture, you're right. You don't have to. I took care of a friend of mine who is a physician who had her implant ruptured for four years, saline on one side, just because she was busy, she got pregnant, she had another kid, so busy because it was her fourth kid, and then she's like, okay, I need you to take it out and put a new one in. No, because- Weren't they really uneven the whole time? I put them in when she was much younger, okay. and she was bigger and had breast tissue now, so mm. it wasn't that big of a difference, but it seems four years is a long time to walk around with a deflated implant, just FYI. Yeah. I mean, if they were both deflated, yeah. I don't prefer for people to deflate the other one. But I mean, ideally, you do want to remove them, which you can do under local. But yeah, silicone, the problem is over time, it can cause inflammation and you get right. granulomas and, and scar tissue and things like that. Somebody come in who you know, had her in the, long in the 80s and they were clearly past their prime. 
So that makes it a more difficult surgery because they're calcified and ruptured. And now the pocket is distorted because the implant has ruptured and then the capsule like walls it off and then it ruptures and then it walls it off. So now you have this like weird blob in there. That's a little bit of a hot mess. Mm -hmm. I've seen really extreme cases. Sorry, we're gonna get some cat tail in here, I think. But where one patient had had implants removed that were ruptured and then there was still enough like silicone inflammation of the tissue that it wouldn't heal. And then I went and excised more and there were like was more scar tissue and bits and it still, it did not want to heal just because the silicone had kind of seeped into the tissue. Although those are also the older generation implants from the 80s and 90s, the silicone in them was much more liquidy, like honey. The newer cohesive gel is very solid, although I right. can't tell you what it's going to look like in 25 years. Right, I agree. But them. yes, the older implants, unfortunately, those are the ones that if they've been in for a long time, they weren't even, they were honey to start with or motor oil. and They just sort of right. bleed everywhere. That's where they get one of the silicone bleeding problems where it's just going into the tissue and your body starts to wall it off or has an inflammatory re that being said if you're right. 10 years out from having your augmentation and you don't have any problems and if you're of an age to get a mammogram and mammograms fine and or you've had an ultrasound or an mri to check them out just keep on tracking don't mess with them then you're fine that's the nice thing too. Mm -hmm. Ultrasound is so widely available mm -hmm. now. It used to be a forty thousand dollar machine, so we didn't have it. We'd order you one, but now it like hooks to your cell phone. I have a little probe. I was able to bring it home and ultrasound my nanny last time she was pregnant. But now we can just ultrasound right. patients in the office straight. and check for ruptures. So that's much more simple. Okay. So, yep. Yeah. All right. That's a common one. I get a lot of questions about like, do I need to wear a bra all the time, or will my breast sag? That one is interesting because people talk about like ligaments in the breast. It, it's soft tissue, guys. It stretches over time. And it will stretch over time, especially if you gain weight or you're pregnant. That said, I do recommend, and I don't know if you do this, I do recommend to all my augmentation patients to at least Bra. sleep in a loose sports bra. Because, yeah, really, if they can. I mean, just that added weight, you're adding a good 300, mm -hmm. 400 grams to the breast. It's, I, I feel like. That's it's not, putting weight it's on a it. smart move. When I had my augmentation, I slept with a bra for probably a couple years just because I was afraid of them moving. <laughs> but, um, and they weren't, yeah. you know, not that large. But um, I've also had people tell me the whole point of getting an augmentation is to not have to wear a bra. <laughs> which, right. which you this don't. But I mean, it's not like... <laughs> there have been any randomized controlled trials where somebody supports one side, not the other. Yeah, and there's so many other factors, blood. right? It depends on the quality yeah. of your skin, right? So if you have scratch marks going into it, mm -hmm. I would say probably mm -hmm. lean towards the bra. And if you um, have large implants, large heavy implants, if you have subglandular implants, it's going to stretch everything out faster. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and if your skin is sun damaged, I mean, there's not too many topless people. If you smoke, you smoke. yeah. So all of those things are going to make your breast tissue drop faster anyway. So maybe support it with a bra. So you tell them. Per I went to a conference one time where some ancient old man got up there and was talking about his post-op protocol, protocol for augmentation and said that he told his patients they had to sleep on their back. And I was like, okay for the rest of their life. And I was like, no. That's not gonna happen, yeah. I mean, I tell them like, ideally, mm -hmm. at least like a tank top with a shelf bra. Like support it a little bit. I'm not saying like right. full on bra, or like no, a loose sports bra. Yeah, yeah. Oh. and then if you're doing anything yeah. high impact, right. and I get okay. I think if you are run a lot, bra. all those things have impact over time. You definitely should wear some support. I don't know why you would go running or do high impact right. without a bra. Right. Can you get a breast lift without That's removing implants? So good question. It's going to be very patient dependent. How long have the implants been in? Are they in so the right place? I would say if they're under the muscle, you know, if they're probably. Then yeah. 
Yeah. Or if they're like two year old implants and the breast tissue is just dropping off them because you didn't do a lift at that time. I would absolutely say, can hey, do um, I just saw a brand new breast augmentation patient today. And that's one of my, I talk about all the different decisions. One of them is whether you go under the muscle or subglandular. And one of my arguments for going under mm -hmm. the muscle is that the muscle supports the implant over time. So if your breast tissue does drop with age, gravity, whatever, then it's much easier to do that lift over the uh, over the implant. Yeah, so absolutely. Oh yeah, two years out, those are pretty new implants. And if it's you don't not a big uh, mastopexy, a lot of times I'll do it under local or sedation. You don't need a you don't need to go under yeah. general anesthesia. Still two weeks of you no know, raising your heart rate of blood pressure afterwards, but yeah, the recovery is much faster. Yeah. So definitely doable. Let's see. Yeah. Oh, let's talk about yeah. breastfeeding yeah. and breast surgery. I have mm -hmm. people wait six months after they stopped, but be aware, people, your breasts make milk mm -hmm. for a long time. Like I've seen milk in there a year I did out. Um, so. an augmentation mastopexy on someone who was in the healthcare profession, as you all know, are usually um, the, <laughs> the worst, we're the worst patients. Anyway. So she had sworn up and down that she had stopped breastfeeding like a year ahead. And I went in there and as I was um, in, making an incision in the breast tissue, I was rearranging stuff. And um, my anesthesiologist at the time had leaned over, was talking to me and I happened to hit a breast, a milk duck and it sprayed out. <laughs> and luckily he was wearing eyeglasses <laughs> and it hit him right in the eyeglass. And he just stopped what he was doing. And I was like, hey, I'm really sorry. I She's not even supposed to be breastfeeding. So I don't know what this is all about. Emily, um, is bodily fluids I go? He was, not a bad this was not the baby. baby. So he was traditionally yeah, a pediatric anesthesiologist. And he's like, that's why I don't operate. Um, or don't yeah. work with adults. <laughs> I was like, you need to calm down. He had to step out. He was so appalled. But yeah, so you don't want to operate oh if you are breastfeeding or recently breastfeeding for lots of reasons. If you're putting an implant in, there's a foreign body. So breast milk isn't sterile. So you don't want to create potential for an infection, right? Um, Right. Also, it can stop your incisions from healing if you get a breast milk fistula where the milk is coming yep. out. And the then also, awesome. um, if if it's not an implant related case, if it's like a breast lift or breast reduction, I tell people, well, if your breasts, are, if you're still breastfeeding, your breasts are changing shape. So now we're trying to get a moving target. So right. maybe wait for that shape to settle out. Like once you're done breastfeeding, your um, breast might shrink down a little bit more and I don't want to take off tissue that's not even going to be there in six months. So that's another reason. There is one operation I'll do right. um, if they're just, you know, like a month done, not actively breastfeeding, but recently completed. And that's just implant removal if they're just taken. Because oh, yeah. you're really not coming across any of the milk exactly you're, you're not control. trying to change and that's just straight removal we're not trying to change the shape we're not doing a lift we're not doing fat grafting they just want to get them out that's totally fine but yeah right how to oh usually six months it takes a while for the breast milk to dry up so i usually tell people six months so i'll see them for a consultation mm -hmm. about three months after they've stopped and then you know we're booking out three months. So that's how long, which I've tried to be really conscious and ask anyone with a kid like four and under, right? They've been yes. breastfeeding recently. You just don't. Yeah, you, you just don't, don't want to, like I said, you're trying to get the shape and the size right. And that's still changing might not be you on the day to day, but over yeah. months it is. And then also the risk of having contamination or a fistula is no fun. Right. So peripherally related question will you do toxin or filler injections on patients because no. <laughs> that comes no, up a lot. i won't <laughs> but um i know we've informally no. pulled female plastic surgeons and we've all done it. and it varies yeah i will i got toxin and filler injection well I got them while I was pregnant because I do it on myself but i will definitely do toxin and filler injections on uh patients I feel like it, it, that there's no, not nothing that shows it's like it shouldn't go anywhere I mean, there's no express yeah 
Right. It's not going to go in the breast milk. Now, pregnancy, it's just such a litigation issue. Oh, side mm -hmm. lipo with breast reduction. I think yeah. we both do side lipo with breast reduction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's part of my standard reduction. If, I mean, some people really don't have yeah, any fat nice. there, but if you do, nice. I like it. It's a nice like touch. Um, yeah. So yeah. that's breastfeeding. We covered the bra. Let's, we got to talk pumping and dumping. And I know this isn't a surgical topic. There's actually there's a whole Facebook group of physician women who breastfeed, which I got added to when I had my third kid. Cause I've breastfed three kids and I pumped exclusively for the third one. And it's such a hot topic on there because medicine is not really up to speed on what you need to pump and dump for, which is almost nothing. Oh, wait, wait, like they will tell yeah. you narcotics. Um, basically. Yeah. Like, like <laughs> if you have an MRI with the gadolinium, if you have a CT scan, they'll tell you to pump and dump. And there are very few medications where you actually cannot breastfeed afterward. And alcohol too is another big one that comes up. So if you're taking narcotics, basically if you're awake enough to like hold the baby, you're okay. You can breastfeed. And then for alcohol, what I learned, thank you to the Dr. Milk group, is your breast milk alcohol content is equal to your blood alcohol content. So if you're totally slosh and your blood alcohol content is 0.08, that's the breast milk content. That's oh, like equivalent to orange juice. That's, okay, yeah. So that it's low. It's like, like that's, that's what the baby's <laughs> getting. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's like a fermented kombucha. So basically, if you're, if I think the rule of thumb was if you can find the baby, you can feed the baby. Like if you're, if you're sober enough to safely hold the well, baby that's without interesting. Pausing. So someone, I mean, it shouldn't have been that hard to look at, right? You just take breast milk from somebody who's pumping and dumping or doing whatever and test it. Interesting. Yeah. Good to know. Yep. Yeah. So it's exceedingly low unless you were like passed out drunk. But the other thing you could also do is pump that milk and then dilute it with milk that has no alcohol in it. So people throw out a lot of breast milk unnecessarily, which yeah, if you've you ever breastfed, that. that's um, right. Yeah. yeah. It's too hard. Yeah. So that was my little. <laughs> thing no, that's milk. good. Let's see. What other. Um, well, here's another. It's not a breast myth, but I think it's something that comes up. Um, that little. Uh, as Ashley Malfi calls it, chicken nugget, that little tissue that's in between your arm, um, armpit and the breast, that little axillary yes. fat pad is either a little fat pad, but sometimes it can also be excess or accessory, not excess, accessory breast tissue. And um, I think it yeah. does really well with liposuction, but um, sometimes the first thing I do, I look, if somebody looks like they have accessory breast tissue, which is breast tissue up there, is if you look along like what would be a milk line, you can often see an accessory nipple somewhere along there, right? Mm -hmm. So you can see, hey, also you have this little mole here that is supposed to be a nipple. Yeah, or nipple. underneath their breast, yeah. like on the chest wall. Which... Yeah, I remember learning about that in medical school and I was doing a master's in biomedical ethics and one of my classmates was like, oh, I have one of those. Yeah, so I... Like I said, I usually treat that with liposuction as well. Do you? I I lipo this area and almost all my reductions because everyone's just got that little bit of arm fluff. But if it's like, sometimes you'll see like a big mass of tissue right. and extra okay. skin and then I excise. Right. Because yeah. you got to get that extra skin on I too. I got to do that because I try to hide incision, incision in the arm. But yeah. It's, I would, yeah. yeah, you don't want to have somebody self-conscious about an incision up in their axilla or not be able to wear tank tops or something. But yes, I have had to excise it a couple times because they legitimately just have like a second breast there or, you know. Yeah, exactly. And in that case, like they're probably way more comfortable with the scar than they were wearing right. tank tops with exactly. that big mask. Um, and then actually yeah. this came up today in clinic. Somebody asked me about fat transfer to the shoulder grooming for breast reduction, which Dr. Malfi had oh. done uh, a study on it a long time ago. Um, but I was doing, a, um, you know, doing liposuction on this patient anyway. And she has shoulder grooving from just large breasts from augmentation and she likes the size of her breasts. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, we talked about putting a little bit of fat in there to try and see if you can you know, smooth that out. It's just, if you're already there and you have fat, kind of why not, right? Right. Otherwise, you yeah. have a sculptor, maybe? Uh, but it's a little expensive. Because it's not a... 
<laughs> yeah. Interesting. Although you feel, I feel like, you know, if they still have large breasts or we, large implants. We talked about that. Keep but if you're doing um, liposuction yeah. with your breast reduction, it just throw a little in yeah. there. Yeah. 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 I feel like, like she presented at a that. women's conference. So Dr. Sneed is joining us. So yeah, that's my um, other things you haven't considered with your breast tissue. What about um, nipples or inverted nipples or any of that? Do you do a lot of that surgery? I do some. The interesting thing is I had, I think like a 17, 16 year old patient come in once for inverted nipples. And I really didn't feel comfortable doing something that was normal anatomy and that would prevent function later. <laughs> yeah, like, I know she didn't want to yeah. breastfeed and didn't on it but so when you have inverted nipples guys it's because the milk ducts are shortened and the correction you cut those ducts so it can pop out like imagine a little tuft in upholstery but, but it was like totally cosmetic and would create a loss of function instead of a gain of function and she really didn't want to try any of the non-surgical options like they make these oh. little i mean it's like a suction cup with a syringe to stretch the duct, and she didn't want to try that. She didn't want to try piercing. Yeah, I mean, piercing seems like an easy way to work around that. What teenagers do. Yeah. Yeah, so I've done a couple. I mean, often if you're doing, often when I see them and they're really bad, it's because there's excess skin compared mm -hmm. to breast volume too. So when you correct that tissue envelope to volume ratio either by adding an implant or doing a lift then it seems like the inversion gets so, better because the underlying supported. tissue is better i just supported. augmentation last week where that yeah. she asked about her i was like i don't like messing with the nipple at the same time i'm doing an augmentation because that is not as right. clean and i don't want to contaminate anything so we can always do it later and then it it um everted with the augmentation so problem solved yeah <laughs> Oh, so other fun fact about nipples and reductions or lifts, I try to remember to tell my patients, like, if you have a horizontal <laughs> bar pierced in your nipple, it's going to rotate 90 degrees or somewhere less than that, because the nipple rotates that up into a new position. That's a little tip to let people know. So, yeah. Yeah, like, by the way, your nipple piercing is going to be 90 degrees from where it is. No yeah, one's care. They're like, yeah, whatever. Yeah, no, I've oh, had somebody that, ask okay. me that before because they had like a mole on their areola and then they're like, actually like, oh, what happened here? And I was like, well, it all rotates the moles now here. But it's funny because I do think that no, like the average patient doesn't think about what we're doing to get the nipple in its new position. And a common myth is that we're just taking it off right. and putting it back on, which you almost never Yes. And we almost never do that. Like that's just very, very large breast reductions. Well, and it's yeah. confusing to like try to imagine that three dimensional thing. If you go on my TikTok, I have like a time lapse. Oh. I did a Play-Doh breast mm -hmm. reduction a couple of years ago so that I could like show things rotating and what came out. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've had anesthesiologists go, huh, I was, wasn't quite sure how you're going to put that together. And I'm like, really? <laughs> Are you new? I knew exactly what the point I was. So I yeah, if your nipple and areolar complex stay attached to your breast tissue, and that bit of breast tissue is on what we call pedicle, and that rotates in some fashion to the new position. So yeah, it it's crazy because it totally <laughs> makes sense to us, but if only because we've done it a hundred times, right? So. And even What's as a resident, on? I was like, yeah. wait, where does that tissue come out? And this rotates up. Yeah. But then you, like, figure it all out. You can imagine it. And right. it's part yeah. of mixed plastic You can't unlearn that once you figure it out. So, yes, I think it's – that's interesting. Right. Yeah, I'm surprised I haven't had anybody – because I see – I mean, I feel like everyone in Southern California is pierced. So, pierced or tattooed. hasn't come out. Hmm. Yeah. Know. Okay. What other fun breast facts do we have? Oh, are yeah. you ever too old to get a breast reduction? I get the question a lot. All of people come in and be like, am I too old for this? Woman, if yeah. you are alive and breathing and healthy, I've done then odds no. on people in their 50s and 60s. So yeah. you want to? Like, go that, for it. If, you are, you if your surgery, general health yeah. is good. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, some people just put stuff off. Now, the breast reductions, what I always tell my young patients is that 
you might need the surgery down the road if your breasts change with pregnancies or you know age and weight and stuff mm -hmm. but my 50 and up patients that have it done are like oh i should have done this 20 or 30 years ago so yeah oh that is always yeah, the biggest complaint so that, that they fight in and those patients too i find have had enough life experience whether that's like joint replacement or having kids that right, they're yeah. like oh that was not that yeah. i took tylenol it does hurt it's just i think they've got other life yeah, experiences they where they're, it's just not a big deal. They, yes exactly i had an elderly lady who i believe was yeah. 70 or more who i did a breast reduction on she did great and she's like, I'm just so grateful that when I bend over to brush my teeth, my boobs aren't in the sink. <laughs> and I was like, yep. Good. Fun. Yes, <laughs> Fun so. That reminds me, one of the best consultations we ever had at the VA when I was in residency was um, a request for a scrotal Pepsi because his scrotum like hit the water in the toilet bowl when he sat down to pee. He wasn't concerned with the fact right. that he had to sit down. I think there was like, a buried mm -hmm. penis issue too, which that is a medical condition, guys, by the way, where it gets kind of tucked in, doesn't pop out, and then it gets irritated and there's scar tissue around it. One of our urologists in our surgery center was actually doing surgery for it this week. And I made the mistake of yes. peeking in and going, oh, oh. urologists, are, yeah, we need them. <laughs> yeah, she's like, first step, I degloved the I whole know. shaft. I'm like, I used what? to help with those actually, because they, some needed full thickness skin graft, yeah. so. Yeah, um, I think she just closed with scrotal skin and it, it turned out great, but it's funny, stuff that makes me squirm, like I will just peel down your forehead to do a brow, I mean, I don't do that technique anymore, yeah. but it bothers me not at all, but yeah. deep loving <laughs> things <laughs> bothers me. All right. <laughs> okay, on that. All right, note. well, I will see you next week, right? At... I know. I so excited Wednesday night. I'm coming in Thursday yeah I'll text you okay we, do you have dinner plans I have options every evening I don't know I haven't made any because I know there was a big WPS dinner on Thursday but oh. I have my boyfriend and I didn't want to like expose him to like a hundred other women and torture okay. him the whole so okay. there's a yeah, yeah. but but we'll hang out. I mean, I'll not, drag in with dinner with people at some point. point. I just yeah, figured not the whole crowd. I'm going to a smaller rep sponsored thing, but I will let you know. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you oh, definitely right. yeah. because you're both Navy veterans. That's too. excellent. Yeah. All right. Well, it was good to. Nice. Well, I will see you. See you. Fantastic. Bye. Thanks for joining Everybody. us, everyone. Have a great night.